Uh, welcome to the uh, April 27th uh, Planning Commission uh, meeting. Uh, recommendations of the Planning Commission on certain items from this agenda will be considered by the Board of Commissioners at their regular meeting on May 5th, 2020 at 10.30 a.m. The Planning Commission utilizes speaker request forms which are available in the Commission chambers during the meeting. Again, um, I've, I've received uh, several of these already, but if you wish to speak on an item um, and you're not the applicant or the applicant's agent, um, th those folks get to, to speak on their items automatically. But uh, uh, go ahead and fill one of these out. They're located at the back of the room. Bring it up here in the dais and just helps keep uh, things organized on our end um, regarding the meeting. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and, and start the, the roll call. Rich is here, obviously. <laughs> Rich. Yeah. Kathy. Here. Travis. Here. Sandy. Here. Gary. Here. Sunny. Here. All right. Um, first item on the agenda is approval of the April 13th, 2020 minutes. Uh, are there any changes or considerations to the minutes that anyone has? Seeing none here in the dais, um, uh, Kathy, do you have any changes? No. Okay, unmuted. Now we can hear you, Jim. Can you hear us, Jim? Okay, all right, all right, I'm gonna hang up. Okay, can you hear me now? Jim, we can hear you, can you hear us? Give me a thumbs up. Good. The eagle has landed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, so, Jim, we were in uh, the, the middle of approval of the 18, uh, April 13th, 2020 minutes. Do you have any changes to those minutes? No. Sandy, do you have any changes to the minutes? I was not at the meeting, so I, I have no comment. Thank you. And Sonny? No. With that, I would entertain a motion for approval of the... Go move. Second. Motion and second, uh, further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, uh, vote by roll call. Mm -hmm. Rich? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Jim? Aye. Travis? Aye. Sandy? Abstain. Gary? Aye. Sunny? Aye. Um, item carries. Next item is approval of the agenda. Uh, today on the consent agenda, we have items uh, three through 12, um, uh, followed by uh, items 13 through 16 as, as new business uh, with the construction permit agenda items 17 through 20, followed by our, our normal uh, county items below that that go to 25. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Motion and second for their discussion. Gary, we're doing it again. Seeing none and hearing none, uh, all those in favor uh, vote by roll call. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Aye. Sunny. Aye. Motion carries. This brings us to the consent agenda this morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Brittany Molitor, Planning Director. The consent agenda. The following items have been placed on the consent agenda for action to be taken on all items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda by the Planning Commissioner, a staff member, or an audience member for separate consideration. The findings of this Planning Commission are recommendations to the Pennington County Board of Commissioners who will make the final decision. Item number three is conditional use permit review CU 1323 for Todd Syme. It's for, to review accessory buildings without a principal structure in a limited agriculture district. And staff is recommending approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1323 with conditions. Item number four is conditional use permit review CU 1425 for Jeff Devaney to review two storage units to be located on a subject property in a highway service district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1425 with conditions. Item number five is conditional use permit review CU 15-20 for Mitch Morris 
to review a construction equipment sales in a general commercial district. Staff recommends to continue the review of conditional use permit CU 1520 to the May 11, 2020 Planning Commission meeting with two conditions. <coughs> Item number six is conditional use permit review CU 1604 for Alex and Mikhail Kaliza to review a vacation home rental in a limited agriculture district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1604 with conditions. Item number seven is conditional use permit review CU 1716 for Schoolhouse LLC, Larry Tuber, to review a vacation home rental in a low density residential district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1716 with conditions. Item number eight is conditional use permit review CU 1717 for SC Meridian LLC, Larry Tuber is the agent, to review a vacation home rental in a suburban residential district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1717 with conditions. Item number nine is conditional use permit review CU 1718 for SC Meridian LLC, Larry Tuber is the agent, to review a vacation home rental in a low density residential district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit 1718 with conditions. Item number 10 is conditional use permit review CU 1719 for SC Meridian LLC, Larry Tuber is the agent, to review a vacation home rental in a low density residential district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit 1719 with conditions. Item number 11 is conditional use permit review CU 18, or 1810 for Ray and Aaron Atkins to review an accessory structure, a garage, prior to a principal structure in a limited agriculture district. Staff recommends to continue the review of conditional use permit CU 1810 to, to the September 17, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. And finally, item 12 is conditional use permit review CU 1823 for BCS Invest LLC. Kevin Haberstroh is the agent to review six storage units and a caretaker manager's, manager's residence in a general commercial district, general agriculture district. Staff recommends approval of the extension of conditional use permit CU 1823 with conditions. Thank you. Are there any items that uh, staff wishes, wishes to pull from the consent oh, agenda? Not today. Items uh, from the membership that we, we wish to pull? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull number five. I have a question. Okay. Seeing no one else on the dais here. Um, any uh, anybody? Jim, Kathy, Sandy, Sunny. Any items? No, I don't have anything. Okay, Sandy. No, I'm fine. And Sunny. None from me. Okay. For those sitting in the audience uh, today, the items three through twelve, if that's one of your items, are on the consent agenda. We will vote on all of these items uh, with one vote. Um, are there, is there any items um, that anyone wishes to pull from the consent agenda uh, that are that are in the audience? Anybody have any uh, any item they wish to pull? Okay, uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion for items. Uh, Three, four, six through 12. So move. Oh. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Aye. Sunny. Are you there, Sonny? Aye. Thank you. Um, those items carry. This brings us to item five in the agenda. Jason, I got a couple of questions. Um, we've seen this property a few times, and dealing with the fence, that's just kind of my question. Do they not, does he already not have a fence there? I remember before we've had pictures, and I thought he had a fence up there. He didn't have a fence there. I I spoke to the applicant during the review process and he said that he did have a fence and he's currently in the process of taking all the equipment off of the property. So he's removed the fence. Okay. And see, I thought, said, I thought he had one because I thought we had talked about it and the, his fence was at a certain height, but the highway is at another height. And we were like, well, wait a minute, if we do something different, I thought we were going to just have him put something to block the view through the fence originally. But I don't know, maybe there's just been a lot of different things. I just wanted to verify what was going on. So he's actually taking the fence down and he's That's what he, stuff His off. plans are to end this conditional use permit on September 1st. He plans to have all that equipment off there by then. Okay, that makes sense. Because I was like, wait a minute, I don't, 
I thought we had fixed the fix the fence issue a while back. All right, I don't have anything else, and I would move approval. Second. Motion and second for approval. Further discussion? Any discussion, uh, Jim? No. Kathy? No. Sandy? No. And Sonny? No. Okay, um, no further discussion. Uh, roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Jim? Aye. Travis? Aye. Sandy? Aye. Gary? Aye. Sonny? Aye. Item carries. This brings us to item 13 on the agenda. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Cody Sack, Environmental Planner. Item 13 is conditional use permit CU 20-07. It's to allow a temporary contractor's equipment storage yard on the pro subject property and highway service. The applicant is Black Hills Energy. The landowner is Andrew Edson. Uh, the contractor storage yard is they are um, replacing a power line up by Pactola in Hill City. The contractor's equipment storage will be used to house the equipment for that project. Uh, currently, the lot is zoned highway service. It is 0.73 acres. There's no special flood hazard area on the property. Uh, it was routed around for comment. Uh, the only comment that I got really back was from the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Um, it stated that if Black Hills Energy plans to utilize the area during the rally, that they would recommend that the access be off of a, um, a certain access point um, off of Mill Iron Drive. Um, other than that, there's really no no comments. Um, staff did receive this morning a call from the neighboring property. Um, I believe it is this lot right here that currently there is a um, Black Hills Energy truck that is sitting there with equipment on it, and it is his private property. And he is concerned that um, it will continue once this gets approved. I believe he is on the phone to call in as well. Um, so staff would only maybe make a condition that if this once this gets approved that um, no equipment can be placed in that parking lot or on anybody else's property. It sounds kind of intuitive. Um, with conditional use permits, there's five considerations. Uh, the first is the effect upon the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity. Um, this is a temporary use. I believe that they plan to be done by um, fall or the end of the year, depending on weather. Um, and staff cannot predict the effect of property values in the immediate vicinity. Um, the effect upon normal and orderly development and improved surrounding vacant property. Um, allowing this conditional use should not affect the normal orderly development or improvement of any surrounding property in the area. That utilities, access roads, drainage, or other necessary facilities are provided. Um, there's currently no utilities. I guess there is a power box on the property. Um, but the applicants would provide the rest of the necessary utilities that they would need. Um, the off-street parking and loading requirements are met. Um, it appears that the lot size would um, meet that requirement and that measures taken to control offensive orders, fumes, dust, noise, vibration, and lighting so that none of these will constitute a nuisance. Um, the use by nature could produce odor, fumes, dust, noise, vibrations. Um, reasonable measures should be taken to uh, minimize the that as a nuisance. So staff is recommending approval of conditional use permit CU uh, 20 07 with 11 conditions. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the speakers on this item, are there any questions for staff from the dais here? Seeing none. Um, <coughs> Kathy, do you have any questions for staff? Yeah, I just, I'd like the, to be reminded of the um, the requirements for notice on these conditional use permits like this in terms of who gets sent notice, uh, how long the sign is up that's saying there's a conditional use permit and so on. If they could just be, if I could just be reminded of that, I'd appreciate it. So uh, the sign has to be posted 10 days prior to the meeting date and letters sent are sent to the property owner certified return receipt um, 10 days prior to anybody who is within 500 feet um, of the property. In this case, do you know how many property owners received that? You'd have to look in the file. Do you have the file? 
I don't have the file on me, so I wouldn't be able to. I don't know that offhand. All right, thank you. Jim, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not really. Okay, Sandy? No, thank so, you. And Sonny? Uh, just one thing is the... Um, the permit is temporary with the applicants planning to finish this later this year. Is, is there a more specific timeline of how long this storage yard would be used? Um, I can't remember the specific date, but the applicant is in the audience who could probably answer that question better than I could. Okay. We'll go to That's that. That's my we'll... only question. Thanks. All right. Uh, with no... Go ahead, Kathy. Sure. Yeah, I have one more. Regarding the notice, the sign and so on, does the sign stay up? Uh, let's say this gets approved here, but it goes on to the uh, Board of Commissioners, right? Does the sign stay up during that interim time? Uh, so conditional use permits do not go in front of the Board of Commissioners. Uh, the applicants can actually bring the sign back today, the day of the meeting. I see. Okay, thank you. Further questions for staff? Cody. Okay, seeing none. We do have uh, speaker request on the uh, forms on this as well as uh, we, uh, one of the adjacent landowners on, on the phone. Um, I guess uh, Shannon uh, Paul, Paul Miller, are you in the audience? Yeah. We, we just have the one question I think to answer and then we can go to the neighbor. Okay. Yes, please come forward, uh, state your name, uh, at the podium for the record. Uh, hi, I'm Shannon Paul Miller with Black Hills Energy. Um, and I can just, I forget what that question was again. So the question was specifically in regards to the, um, uh, if there's a more exact time frame or schedule for the project to be complete. Yeah, we're anticipating to start um, here in May and then we plan to go through December 31st and um, that's weather dependent, so we might finish a little early, but that's the plan. Okay. Did you catch that, Sonny? May May through December. Okay, thank you. Does it does that answer your question, Sonny? Yes, it does. Okay. Any further questions for uh, Shannon? All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have, uh, it's my understanding, adjacent landowner, uh, Jerry Wagner. Is he on the line? Yes, I am. Jerry, uh, this is Rich Marsh from the Planning Commission. Please, sir, go ahead and and uh, and, and let us know what your concerns. I'm concerned about is this, this is, uh, I believe that, that um, you know, people are thinking that this is a corner lot. That, that the permit is being asked for, the corner lot, the one closest to 385 is, is lot 11. Um, this lot is lot 10, which is in farther. And, and the, the, the road system that's there, um, I, main, I maintain um, that. And, and of course, that some of the expense gets, ex gets expense to the rest of the, the lot owner. Um, but um, uh, well, I'm concerned about the road. I'm concerned about my parking lot. That right now, there's there's poles, a uh, truckload of poles setting there. Um, that um, um, on our lot, and I'm assuming. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming that they belong to that project. And but I have, wasn't able to get a hold of anybody uh, to find out whose lot they uh, or whose poles, who belongs to the poles or who the poles belong to. Okay. Um, a few things that I have concerns with. Um, you're in, it's mine, you said that the lot that would be uh, proposed for this project for the Edsons is lot 10, not lot 11. Is that correct? Yes, the lot 11 is the one that's closest to 385. And it's my understanding and, that's... Um, um, Go ahead. So, uh, and, the, and from what I've seen on, on 
the Pennington County uh, notice was lot 10. Hmm. Cody, do you? And in order to get to that lot, they've got to go in and go farther into the project. And whether or not they can use even 11 without getting onto my property is is not even known. Those trailers are long. Uh, this, the, the tractor and the trailer with the poles are, um, I'm going to go ahead and say 65 feet long, something like that. They take a big area to turn. Okay, sir. I, I think that there's uh, there is some confusion here. Our staff report indicates that the the lot is uh, in question that we're talking about is lot eleven, not lot ten. Is that correct? Correct. It's lot eleven, and we just pulled up the notice that was sent. It says lot eleven. Okay, but he's saying that they don't that someone else owns lot eleven. So the person who the person who they are leasing this from owns both lots eleven and ten. Ten is the lot to the south. The lot to the north is the one that they're looking at doing the contracting storage on. That's lot eleven. That was the one that was advertised. Okay. Conditional use permit. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe I'm confused. So Andrew and uh, Alicia Edson are leasing the property they they own it black hills energy is leasing it from them or paying that I, I i don't know the ins and outs of it but they are using andrew's property for this contractor storage yard andrew owns it and he owns lot both lots 10 and 11 but lot 11 is the one that they're proposing it's the one that's up on the screen and it's the one that was advertised out to the adjacent right. owners so what you're saying is in is in uh May, follows this. Yes. Uh, Mr. Wagner, um, this is different than what you're indicating. Is that correct, sir? That are, are you saying that the owners of lot 11 is are not the Edsons? Um, yes, they they own both lots. They own uh, Andy owns both lot 11 and 10. Yes. So now I'm confused. But I was on the under the assumption. Uh, from what I seen was that, that it was lot 10 is the one that they was asking for permission, use and review permission. No, sir. They, they're asking specifically for lot 11. And um, so where, and that is the, 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 as I understand the map that I'm looking at here on, on the dais, that is the lot immediately adjacent to uh, Highway 385. It is. Okay. And so where is your lot? Well, I own I own lot uh, lot seventeen, um, twelve, and thirteen. Okay. And I own lot nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. And the poles are currently on what lot? I own. And so my portion of 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 the the maintenance on on the road system um, is much higher than than what anybody else's would be. Sure. And also, lot seventeen is is also ours that the the convenience store sets on. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw something out, I guess, for everyone's consideration. Um, what what lot are the poles currently on? They're on lot. They're on lot um, 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a representative from uh, Black Hills Energy here, sir. And, and if it's okay with you, I would propose that I give your phone number uh, to her. And, and, and I believe that she'll be able to uh, resolve the, these polls if they are indeed Black Hills Energy polls and get those on the, the appropriate lots. With, with respect to the rest of what you've said, it's my understanding that you have concerns about the, um, the, the road uh, access and the maintenance of that road coming in and out of the storage lot. Is that correct? That's correct. And then also lot, the maintenance um, to lot, to lot 13, uh, 12 and 13. Okay. Cody was the road maintenance. I'm stating that, that there's no way to get into, I, I don't believe from, from the, what I'm seeing there right now, 
And I own a construction company, and we have belly dumps and semis and 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 uh, um, pop trailers um, behind them. And I know how much area it takes to go in and, and turn some turn something that large. And they're not going to be able to get into into that lot. Um, once you may get into it now when there's nothing on there, but once you go in and start stockpiling things on there, you're not going to be able to get on that small lot other than going on to another lot and back into it. So um, I'm not wanting to stop the project. I want everybody to understand. I just want to go in and be not left with, with a road system and, and a parking lot system that come time for the rally that I can't use because that's what we use that lot for is, is for vendors um, during the rally. And, and, and I don't want a lot that even if they don't work through the rally time table, I don't want to have a lot that, that, that isn't going to be ready for, for my customers. Okay. Mr. Chair, go ahead, That's Gary. Right. So, so, Cody, would you have highlighted there right now? Is that either twelve or thirteen? We may not have a rally, and and um, that's that's another issue. The one that's highlighted is lot thirteen. Thank you. Any further questions for uh, Mr. Wagner or or Cody? So 12 must be right above that then. Um, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's, I was just wondering if, Jerry, if you yeah. have a proposed solution of, for, of, for the ingress and egress that might be workable for, to, to allow you know, your business to go uninterrupted and you know, also allow the big trucks to come in and out. Do you see? Do you see a solution? Um, yes, I mean, but um, and 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 okay, my voice before is, is I'm not trying to go in and stop the project. I'm I'm just one wanting to make sure that I'm compensated for the use of my profit. And and yes, we can sit down and 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 figure out. Um, you know, what portion of the property is going to be at use, what, what the responsibility of the contractor might be. Um, I don't even know at this point in time that we know 100% who the contractor even is. Okay. Um, I, I, Mrs. Paul Miller, I, I have a question for you, if you could come back up. It seems to me that there's um, maybe just some things to work out with the adjacent landowner that w I don't believe that will get through here at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, my question for you is, is if we continue this item to our next meeting, uh, and what, could we do that two weeks from now? What does that do to your construction schedule? Um. I guess it would just push us back a couple weeks. Um, you know, we definitely want to make sure that uh, we address his concerns, and I personally was not aware of any material being, um, you know, hauled to that site yet. We were waiting for permit approval, so um, that's some new information to me that I'll check on for sure. And um, yeah, I guess like he said, we had planned to use that lot 11. Um, that's my understanding of the project. So based on um, it, it sounds like there is some concerns about. Ingre ingress and egress from that lot, uh, being able to get in there, um, and and the, the size of the lot. Um, I guess what, what I would propose is that we postpone this for two weeks, or or continue this item for two weeks. This would allow uh, you and and the adjacent landowners to all get on the same page, um, and and we would come back, uh, assuming that there's some uh, items that are resolved uh, as a result of that. Is that? But um, my concern would be your construction schedule. Yeah. So um, 
I guess we had hoped to start, you know, the beginning of May, so I would push us back a little bit as far as material delivery and um, rebuilding the, the distribution line there. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess if we could get his contact info, I'd be happy to call him today and um, just try and come to a resolution on that. Mr. Wagner, are, are you okay with me giving um, the representative from Black Hills uh, Energy your phone number, sir? Yes, for sure. All right. Yes. That, that would be my proposed uh, solution to allow the adjacent landowners to get on the same page with this item. There's certainly some concerns there. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Gary. I'm wondering if there's a way of doing this of... Uh, allowing uh, Black Hills Energy and Mr. Wagner to try to work this out uh, today or tomorrow and uh, give, uh, give approval contingent on uh, planning department receiving a uh, positive uh, word back from Mr. Wagner that uh, what's been agreed to is, is positive. That way Black Hills Energy is not held up if they can come to an agreement. Have we ever done something like that? Would it be, be a I would be that? agreeable to that. If this is Jerry again. I'd be agreeable um, to that if if we can get this thing worked out in the next couple of days. It'd be it'd be interesting how you would word it though, because if we listed it as a as a condition of approval, what would it say? <laughs> because what if he agrees to ninety percent of it? And not you know. Right. I don't know. It's my concern. Uh, it's an all or nothing item. So. Well, I, well I, I, I'm interested in that because that does sound like a way to move it forward just in case they do, within a day or two, come to terms and it doesn't hold it up for two weeks. Go ahead. Uh, you, you could approve it with a review in two weeks or at, in a month. Um, and then if it's not, if, that ha if the applicant and the landowner hasn't worked it out, that can be discussed then. So it'd still give approval, but it'd be reviewed in a month still. And reviewed or by weeks. us, or would it be re It'd be reviewed by the Planning Commission. In two weeks. In two weeks. How agreeable to that, too. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I'd make that as a, as a motion that we, uh, we give approval to it, uh, uh, contingent on review and at the next Planning Commission meeting. Motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and second uh, to approve item 13 uh, with the addition of um, a condition that it be re uh, reviewed. And so in the, instead of item 11 reading that this conditional use permit be reviewed in one year on a complaint basis or as directed by the Planning Commission and or Board of Commissioners to verify that all conditions of approval are being met, that would be changed to two weeks. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Further discussion? Seeing none here in the dais, uh, Kathy? Nothing more. Jim? No. Sandy? Hi. <laughs> uh, we're just, uh, you have no further discussion is what I'm hearing. Sonny? I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. I, I do have a comment. Go ahead. And, and, and that is, if, if they were to begin their construction or their project and things, and then we were to find out it wasn't an acceptable, then what, we issue a cease and desist order or something? Or, or what? Then what do we do if we start and they haven't actually come to an agreement? Go ahead, Cody. We have Michelle Hoffman coming up here too. Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I think it would work because essentially Black Hills Power if they were to res were to uh, begin construction, would do so at their own risk. So it would behoove them to reach an agreement with the neighbor um, prior to beginning that construction. They would be proceeding Thank at you. risk. Right. Sonny, further discussion? No further discussion from me. All right. Um, 
So a uh, motion and second further discussion. Um, all those in, in uh, favor uh, signify, or I'm sorry, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Aye. Sonny. Aye. Motion carries. Um, Mr. Wagner, we will provide your phone number to the um, uh, to the representative, uh, Mrs. Shannon uh, Paul Miller from uh, Black Hills Corp. Excuse me, Black Hills Energy. Thank you, sir, for uh, attending today. Thank you for your time. Uh, moving on in the agenda brings us to item 14. Item 14 is minor plan unit development amendment PU 20-02. It's to amend, amend an existing plan unit development to allow a garage slash storage building prior to a principal structure in the subject property. Uh, the applicant is Michael and Lorraine Cassidy. A little history of this PUD is uh, Rushmore Ranch. Um, it was originally approved in 94. It was amended in 1997, 2002, and recently, I believe, 2017 as well. Um, the current lot is its own plan unit development. The acreage is 3.03 .03 acres. The access is off Rushmore Ranch Road. Um, the applicant does have a construction permit to grade and level uh, the property for a future building site. That's also at this meeting at a later agenda item. Um, this was routed around. There was really no comments um, back. Um, any concerns or anything? Just emergency services wants an address posted at the property for the for the Morton building, and there is already an address there. It just needs an address point. Um, staff has received some concerns from um, the neighboring uh, property owners uh, about the structure being used as a commercial business. Um, currently, commercial businesses are not allowed in Rushmore Ranch, um, so if the applicant did want to use it as a commercial business, you'd have to come in and get a planned unit development amendment to allow a commercial, a commercial business inside um, the Rushmore Ranch planned unit development. Um, other than that, staff has, has no concerns with it. Um, staff is recommending approval of minor, minor planned unit development, PU 20-02, with 13 conditions. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead. Why do the neighbors think that there might be a commercial business going in there? I mean, um, what's prompting that? From what I heard, there's some large equipment there. Um, I haven't, I know they're doing construction work, so I don't know if that large equipment is part of the construction work or it's been sitting there longer than the construction activity has been going on. Um, that's just their concern is that it will be used for, because it's, a large shop building that they're afraid will be turned into um, a commercial business. Well, this kind of reminds me of that vacuum business where they have a shop and they, they park their vehicles in there and they leave. Is this something that he already, does he already have a business like that? Is that why they're, oh. From okay. what I know, it's supposed to be used for his personal hobby. Okay. So. Any further questions for staff? Okay, um, seeing none, is there anybody in the audience that wishes to speak on this item? Sir, if you could uh, come forward and state your name for the, the record. I am Mike Cassidy, I am building that building and I just wanted to state that it is not for commercial. We have a motor home, we're gonna park in there, a couple of classic cars and I'm a woodworker. And a what? A woodworker? Woodworker. Okay, yes. thank it you. It will be for personal use, yes. All right, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Any further comments on this item? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, with that, staff recommends approval of the minor plan unit development PU 20 02 with uh, 13 conditions. Is, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Aye. Sonny. Aye. 
Motion carries. Um, brings us to item 15. Good morning, commissioners. Jason Thennison, County Planner. Agenda item 15 is layout plan 20-07. Applicant is Robert Shrivers. Other landowners affected are Leland and Penella, Pamela Winchester. Agent is all aspects incorporated in land surveying. The applicant has applied for layout plan 20-07 to reconfigure lot lines in order to create D1 of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter and lot 1A of DRJ subdivision. For ease of description, the subject properties are labeled A, B, and C on the slide, on, to the left of the slide. Lot A is zoned suburban residential district consisting of 0.87 acres, takes access off of Morse Place and it's also within the Morse Place Road District. There's no special flood hazard area, and the only structure on the property is an 8 by 12 shed. Lot B is zoned suburban residential district consisting of 0.24 acres. This lot is not platted. It takes access off of Log Porch Road. It is not located within a road district. There is also a right of way on this property that is not identified on any kind of miscellaneous document or anything like that in the Register of Deeds office. There's no special flood hazard area on the property. It contains a single family residence, on-site wastewater treatment system, and a 16 by 20 shop building. And lot C is zoned suburban residential district consisting of 1.5 acres, takes access off Morse Place, is within, with, is within the Morse Place Road District. There's no special flood hazard area on the property, it contains a single family residence, on-site wastewater treatment system, a 17 by 32 garage, and a 30 by 40 shop building. The proposed lots are on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, lot D1 of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter will be zoned suburban residential district, will increase in size from 2.7, sorry, will increase to size of 0.745 acre and will contain everything I already talked about on the uh, original lot B with the addition of the 8 by 12 shed. And lot 1A of DRJ subdivision will be zoned suburban, residen suburban residential district and will increase to size of 1.831 acres and will contain all the same structures that I described uh, uh, previously. Uh, the request was sent out for interdepartmental review. Uh, County Highway did respond. Uh, they stated that present lot D is not within the Morris Place Road District, but lots 1 and 21 are. Therefore, proposed lot D1 will be partially in the road district and partially out. This needs to be addressed before plan final planning. Also, present lot D is unplanted while lot 21 in Morse, sub Morse subdivision number four and lot one is in DRJ subdivision. The proposed lot descriptions indicate they're taking lot 21 out of Morse subdivision number four and adding part of it to DRJ subdivision and another part to unplanted land. Uh, staff, has already addressed these to, as conditions of approval. Uh, Register of Deeds also came back with comments stating that we would prefer lot D1 be named something else, have it be lot 1B of DRJ subdivision or pick a new subdivision name and have it be lot one of that subdivision. We would like to get away from lots out of section township and range. This is also addressed as a condition of approval. Uh, and staff's review of the uh, proposed layout plan uh, we discovered the following. The proposed lots do not appear to reduce the, re the size of, e of either property below minimum lot size requirements for a suburban residential district. Proposed lot D1 appears to include a portion of National Forest Service land that lies between the original north property lines of lots A and B and the section line. You can see that on the slide up here. Uh, the section line is here. In this blue line, uh, original property lines are just below it and there is a portion of National Forest Service land that down below is the layout plan appears to be included in that. And that'll need to be addressed before a uh, minor plot is submitted. Uh, County and Highway, uh, County Highway and Register of Deeds made comments via interdepartmental review that are included as conditions of approval. Uh, one other thing that I noted during the review of this is that Log Port Road is incorrectly labeled on the layout plan. It's labeled as Community Hall Road on the layout plan. And that's this road here, uh, which also includes the unidentified easement that I noted earlier. And that'll be addressed as a condition of review as well. Uh, overall, staff finds no significant 
issues with the applicant's request as it appears to be in harmony with existing lots and the current and current land uses in the area. Therefore, staff recommends approval of layout plan 20-07 with conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to speaker requests, are there any uh, questions for staff on this item? Seeing none here in the dais, Kathy? No. Jim? No. Sandy? I'm sorry, no. Sonny? No. Okay. Uh, with that, we have two speaker request forms on this. Um, the first one is a uh, um, Frank. I don't know if I'm going to get your last name right, sir. De Cesare. De Cesare. I would have not got that correct. <laughs> I'm going to can't pronounce it. Don't worry about it. Uh, Frank De Cesare, all aspects surveying. Uh, regarding the road name, the original plat calls it uh, Community Hall Road. Uh, I'm not aware of an official name change. There may have been, but that's why it appears that way on this uh, layout plan. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Shrivers, who owns Lot D, uh, I believe he owns all the way to the section line, unless there's something I missed in our research uh, that says that the uh, Forest Service owns anything south of the section line. Okay. Yeah, you, you just... Yep, changed. this is what a uh, rapid map shows here. This is uh, the portion that's in green is General Agriculture District, which is owned by National Forest Service. So it just sounds like there's a portion there that's maybe in question yes, sir. based on the research that you've done, sir. Okay. Well, we'll definitely look into it and try to resolve it before we resubmit. Do you have any questions on the conditions of approval, sir? Uh, I haven't seen them all yet, so I don't know. Okay. Any questions for Mr. De Cesare? Okay. Thank you, sir, for your comments. The next one is uh, Mr. Bob uh, Shrivers. Okay. So just if we have questions for you, is there any, uh, is there any questions for the landowner on this from anyone? Seeing none here up at the dais. Anyone, uh, Kathy, questions for the landowner on this? No. Jim? No. Sandy? No. Sonny? <clears throat> oh. Okay. With that, staff is recommending approval. Uh, excuse me. Does anyone else in the audience have any, uh, would like to speak on this item? All right. Seeing none in the audience, the recommendation is for approval of layout plan LPL 20-07 with uh, 11 conditions. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Aye. Sonny. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, brings us to item 16. Good morning, commissioners. Christina Proetti, county planner. Um, this morning we are revisiting item 16. It's the major planned unit amendment 20-01. The applicant is requesting to amend an existing planned unit development to allow an existing three bedroom single family residence to be used as a vacation home rental. Uh, the subject property is currently zoned as a planned unit development. Um, it has approximately 3.86 acres. Access is taken off of South Rochford Road and there is no special uh, flood hazard area on the property. The lot contains one single family residence with a loft and deck and one detached garage. Uh, the applicant has complied with all of the application submittal requirements for a vacation home rental uh, as listed in the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance Section 319. Um, the South Dakota DENR approved the vacation home rental for a maximum overnight occupancy of six persons. Um, I'll mention Section 213D states that a preliminary planned unit development application shall be submitted for the consideration by the planning, oh, by the zoning commission, or excuse me, by the planning commission to allow for notice 
procedure set forth under Section 512. Um, upon submission of a preliminary plan of a sufficient scope to permit preliminary approval, a formal application for approval of a planned unit development shall be filed. The application must include consent by the owners of the property uh, to be included in the planned unit. The application must uh, be accompanied by a site plan and written uh, statement. Staff will note that we have received comments back from the surrounding neighbors um, and neither neighbors are in favor of the proposed vacation home rental. Uh, staff is seeking guidance from the Planning Commission on how to proceed with this planned unit development. Staff recommends that conditions be included if the Planning Commission approves the major planned unit development. Amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, staff on this item before we go to the speaker requests? Seeing none. Michelle, did you want to um, say something as well before we go to the speaker request forms? Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. Uh, first, like to clarify the issue because um, based on an email by the applicant for the Planning Commission, I think there's some confusion as to what the issues are before this commission. Um, <clears throat> the applicant does correctly state that Pennington County does not consider covenants. That is correct. Uh, covenants are private contracts um, and Pennington County doesn't have any standing to enforce those contracts. Also, we decline to involve ourselves because they often involve complex rules, legal rules of contract construction. That's the first point. Two, uh, the applicant speaks to court decisions in which VHRs are viewed as residential uses. Uh, what the applicant fails to understand is that each of those decisions are based upon the language in those individual covenants and the facts of that particular case. So even though there may be court decisions out there, that doesn't mean a court in Pennington County would construe this, their particular covenants in the same way or that the Supreme Court would. Uh, the majority of jurisdictions do view VHRs as residential uses, those that have considered these covenants. Um, but minority jur uh, jurisdictions also consider them as commercial uses. So again, when we're talking about these covenants, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Each case is going to be dependent on the language in the covenant, and, and, and it comes down to what the party's intent was at that time. And South Dakota, although those cases can give guidance in a particular jurisdiction, South Dakota hasn't even considered a similar covenant. So with all that being said, I want to get to the real issue, and that is because we don't consider covenants, we're not considering this covenant, and that's not what's at issue here today. What's at issue is interpretation of our ordinance. The plan unit development in this case, 04-17, was approved by ordinance in 2005. PUDs are... Uh, negotiated zoning districts, they're very unique, and each zoning district is its own district unto itself. So you might have a PUD resort development that allows VHRs, but a PUD residential development that does not allow VHRs. Each one of these PUDs are negotiated at the time of application between the county and the developer, and the loud uses are very specifically cited in the ordinance. Um, and so that's what we're here to decide. And the ordinance in this case, 04-17, limits the use of this PUD to residential use only. So although the applicant's correct, we don't interpret on the covenants, we're not going to interpret covenants, but it is the function of this body to interpret our ordinance and apply that ordinance. So we have to look at the language in the ordinance and we also have to look at the plan that was submitted by the developer. 
And the plan that was submitted by the developer was very specific that they were going to divide the, the 11.7 acre lot back in 2005 to three lots for the purpose of single family residence only. When you look at the then ordinance in 2005, a single family dwelling was, in, was defined as a building designed to be occupied exclusively by one family. That's what it was defined as. So um, with that in mind, I thought it was also important for us to go back and look at the history of our ordinances. What was in fact allowed in terms of VHRs back in 2005 when this PUD was approved? Because I think that's very relevant to determining what was the intent of the board, what was the intent of the planning commission when they recommended approval and what was the board's intent at the time they approved it. What did they intend by residential use? And besides the plan and the existing ordinance and definitions, I thought it would be useful for this body as well as the public to understand the history of uh, Pennington County zoning ordinance as it applies to VHR. So I actually typed something up yesterday. Okay. I will. Thank you. No, this is. Oh, this, this is different. This is a uh, memo just dealing with history. Oh, yeah. I, I was looking at it on. It was emailed to me. No. That's the other one. Oh, it's the other one? That's this one. This is just uh -oh. history of VHRs. Gotcha. Um, uh, somewhere. <laughs> so I'm going to read this for the benefit of the public since I just drafted this yesterday and as well as the board, uh, the planning commission members who are not present. In 1996, Pennington County enacted a comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Under the zoning ordinance, operation of a vacation home rental was permitted in a resort development. A resort development was considered as a PUD under PCZO section 213B4. Allowed uses within a PUD and conditions of operation slash standards were listed at the time of the rezone to protect zoning property. So you need to keep in mind that under our PUD, we have residential PUDs, then we have resort developments. So in 1996, the HRs were only allowed in resort developments. They were also permitted in general commercial and highway service districts under the definition of hotel or tourist. Again, VHRs were not allowed in residential districts. Then in 1997, the Planning Commission held a public hearing to consider an amendment of the zoning ordinance to permit operation of VHRs as a conditional use in residential districts. The Commission recommended approval of an ordinance amendment to permit VHRs as a conditional use in general agriculture, limited agriculture, low density residential and suburban residential districts. At the meeting of the Board of Commissioners, a motion to approve the proposed ordinance at the first reading failed. So then we move forward to 2007. In 2007, the Board of Commissioners directed staff to draft an ordinance regulating the operation of VHRs. Pursuant to the ordinance amendment as proposed by staff, operation of VHRs would be an allowed use in general commercial, highway surface, and PUDs. However, ordinance amendment 34ZZ as approved and adopted by the BOC, the Board of Commissioners permitted the operation of VHR as an allowed use only in general commercial and highway service. So when directly considered in 2007, uh, VHRs and residential PUDs was rejected at the time of that amendment. In 2009, a further attempt to amend the zoning ordinance and allow VHRs and PUDs also failed. Again, as stated, VHRs were only permitted in approved resort developments as well as now in general commercial and highway service. It was not until 2012 that an amendment was adopted and passed which allowed VHRs in residential PUDs. And the exact language in that ordinance said that they may be allowed. So again, each PUD is an individual district subject to the identified uses within the ordinance we are interpreting the ordinance today. We are not interpreting any covenants. And it appears based upon my research of the legislative history of the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance that throughout all of these proposed amendments and changes, the Planning Commission and the board 
considered VHRs to be commercial uses of the property. And again, independent of what a court might decide in another case, we're only here to determine what the board intended in 2005. And it appears based upon all of the facts I've just discussed that it appears that the intent when it used the term residential use only, it meant just that, that it was going to be for residential use. And that's, that's backed up by the fact it was not until 2012 that VHRs were in fact allowed within a PUD residential district. Thank you. Any questions? Um, is there questions for Michelle? I do have extra copies of this history for the public if anyone would like. Okay, Travis, Gary, anything? No, uh, Kathy? This is Dennis Tushin. I do have a question for Michelle. Uh, hold, hold on just a second. I wanna make sure that all the membership doesn't have questions first. Kathy, do you have any no. questions for Michelle? No, no question. Uh, Jim? Uh, no, not at this time. Sandy? Yes, I, I have some questions, and, mm -hmm. and, and that is this. You know, it, it, it's getting quite old and tiring to review each one of these as they come forward, and it appears as if we in the Planning Commission are uh, being put in a position to, you know, interpret the law you know, practice law without a license. And I, I don't know what happened when, uh, it, it was my understanding that there were going to be special meetings or special consideration to outline terms under which vacation home rentals could be allowed or would be allowed. But it's extremely frustrating to continue to deal with these you know, time, time after time. So I, I don't have the solution, but, but I am uncomfortable attempting to interpret the legal, you know, position on this. Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I think you're, you're, you're referencing the future, our intent to, in the future, um, hold meetings and further amend the VHR ordinance. However, even with that, that wouldn't change what, we, um, you are being asked to do today because the bottom line is, is when 0417, when the property was rezoned to a PUD in 05 as uh, ordinance number 0417, there were very specific uses stated. So no matter what, whether we amend our ordinance in the future or not, your job is going to be to interpret uh, ordinance Amendment 0417 to determine what were the allowed uses as approved by the board at that time. It's its own well, unique my district. Question, my, my question then is, what do you as an attorney recommend that the Planning Commission do in this particular situation? As I stated, um, we we have to look at the language of the ordinance which stated residential use only and we have to attempt to determine what the intent of the commission that recommended the approval of that PUD and what the board's intent at the time they approved that PUD in 05. Um, without going into all the complex rules of, of contract construction that apply, you can look at the you look at the plan. The plan proposed a single family residence. You look at the definition of a single family dwelling that made it clear that it was a single family residence. And you look at the legislative history, which is very clear that VHRs were not allowed in uh, residential PUDs until 2012. So as we sit here, and a court of law could disagree with me, but to the best of my ability, looking at the legis legislative history, looking at the ordinances that were in effect at that time, it appears to me the intent was to allow only single family residential use, not to allow the use of this property as a VHR. So, so your legal opinion then to us would be to deny the application, is that correct? I mean, I understand all the language and things 
we have to preface this with, but is the bottom line that you would recommend denying this application? Well, that is the second question. The first question is how you interpret the ordinance. And, I, and this what is, I'm sorry, I, Travis is smiling at me. I had to spend numerous hours because there's a lot of layers here between the rules dealing with PUDs and the rules dealing with VHRs. So there's a lot of layers. And it's a very good question. So the first question is, what did the board mean? mean? I address that. Now you're getting to the second question. So accepting that interpretation of the ordinance, Mr. Tushin is here now seeking a major amendment. The question is, is whether that major amendment is appropriate. Um, the application is as a major amendment for purposes of change use. The ordinance says that when you have a change in use in a PUD, you treat it like an original application. The PUD ordinance specifically states that when you form a PUD, you have to have the concurrence of all property owners. So in my mind, if there's going to be a use in this PUD, then all the property owners have to be on board under our ordinance. Now, I suppose conversely there could be the argument that he's, uh, Mr. Tushin is applying for a brand new PUD to apply only to his parcel property for purposes of use as a VHR, but I think that becomes dangerously in, akin to spot zoning where you're rezoning something, you're creating a brand new PUD just for one particular use, and it's also not consistent with the purpose of PUDs, and that's for planned unit development of residential developments. Um, that's not what's being proposed here. Uh, this gentleman, the applicant, simply wants to change, change the use that was approved back in 2005. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Travis. Only if, if Sandy's done. I don't I want to make sure she's done. Sandy, are, do you have further questions for Michelle? Well, it sounds as if I'm not going to get a yes or a no answer, so I, I am done. Thank what, you. Well, what I'm trying to say is... If you look at our ordinance as a major amendment, it does not appear legally you, can, you should approve this ordinance amendment because the other property owners are not in favor. And it appears to me that the ordinance requires the uh, concurrence of all property owners. So with that legal opinion, it would be no. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Go ahead, Travis. Uh, Michelle. So I was smiling because she was asking questions along with how you know I like to ask them. And I was going to kind of go back and say, if I read all this correctly, the PUD is, has not been updated or anything since 2005. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So then you would have to go back to what was the intended definitions at 2005 for us to consider uh, what could be allowed from 2005 up until this point. And that's kind of what I was circling through. That's why I was smiling, because I saw where she was going, and I knew what I was going to ask. Yes, and I'd also note that it was reviewed in 2007, but the ordinances um, were the same at that time. Right. Okay. That's what I just wanted to make sure that we were looking on. And Sonny, uh, did you have Mr. any questions Chairman? for Michelle? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I'm curious about this uh, residential usage. Now, my understanding is, is that South Dakota courts have not made any kind of a judgment as to what residential usage, that, that's the way I understood uh, uh, Michelle's um, interpretation. And it seems to me that one could argue that a VHR is not at variance with residential usage. It usually involves one family at a time residing only but for a brief and shorter period of time than a normal per family might in a home. So uh, under the circumstances, it seems to me that residential usage might be interpreted as to include BHRs. And um, correct me if I'm wrong about the South Dakota courts not having found uh, one way or another as to what constitute, if VHRs do constitute single family usage. That's, that's what I'm a little confused about. Um, yes, I, I, I think a lot of people are confused. Those court decisions that we speak to have nothing to do with what the intent of the board was in 2005. Those court decisions are applicable and controlling only to those particular cases. They are interpreting a particular covenant. When these cases have gone up on appeal in Washington, in Oregon, in New York, 
they are only interpreting the language of that particular contract. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand. Uh, those rulings only deal with what was meant by residential use in this particular document between these particular parties, the parties to the contract itself. So they might give you some guidance in other cases as to how a court might rule. But again, every case is, case is fact specific. And again, those cases are dealing with interpretation of covenants in a particular document. Um, we are dealing with the interpretation of our ordinance as it was approved in 2005. So if there was litigation, let's say the, the commission, ultimately the board, was to deny this VHR and the applicant chose to appeal to the circuit court, the circuit court's task would be just to determine what was meant by the board at the time they approved that ordinance in 2005 and nothing more. These other cases in other jurisdictions wouldn't apply. I'm sure they'd be argued um, that state of Washington can looked at the use by the renter in determining whether this was residential use and and there's other rules of contract construction, whether that you know that would apply in terms of whether the court would even go outside the document itself to determine the intent. But yeah, we get caught up in all these other decisions and they don't really apply. Um, you have to decide what was the intent of the board at that time. And I can't tell you whether circuit court would agree with me in my interpretation. I can't tell you whether the South, South Dakota Supreme Court would agree, but that's the challenge. That's why we typically don't deal with covenants because there are similar issues. But again, we're, we're forced to look at this ordinance and figure out what was intended. Does that answer your question? I mean, those cases really don't apply to this case. Those are dealing with separate agreements, separate contracts. Uh, another question. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so if we were to approve this change and allow for a vacation home rental, the other two owners would then be forced to resolve this issue by going to a South Dakota court. Isn't that correct? Well, there's two avenues of remedy for the neighbors. There is, there is a restrictive covenant in place, and it's my understanding that the adjoining neighbors have hired legal counsel, who I believe is present today. And if you recommend and the board ultimately approved uh, the use of the properties of VHR, those property owners could file uh, an action for injunctive relief to enforce the covenants. That's one way they could address it. They also could appeal the decision of the Board of Commissioners as well, arguing that the board's action was um, illegal under our ordinance. So there's two ways that the, um, I believe, and as I indicated, their counsel is present, but I think there's two avenues that they could uh, challenge the use of the properties of EHR? Well, um, if I might continue. Go ahead, Jim. Um, I, I'd like to see some resolution made on some of these. I, I, I'm a little bit like Sandy. I'm tiring of this issue coming up repeatedly and and the, the, the issue being muddied, it seemed, by how people see the actual purpose and uh, function of these vacation home rentals. Um, and I would like to see some, uh, if, if the reason we don't have a case is because nobody, people who have been frustrated by the approval of these have not been so frustrated that they want to spend the money to go to court. And I'd like to see that resolved somehow. <laughs> I, I, I purpose. I, I personally believe vacation home rentals are, for all practical purposes, residential usage and ought to be viewed that way. But um, it, I, I, I would quite frankly like to see this taken to court. Let's get uh, a, a judgment by a South Dakota court and give us a little more guidance. It seems to me, and, unless I'm misunderstanding this. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Kathy. I'd just like to say that um, if you recall back in September of 2018, uh, 
our board, we approved a similar uh, major amendment because one, one owner of the Remington Ranch PUD out here by Three Forks uh, wanted to be a, a vacation rental, even though none of the other property owners were in favor of it. And we actually approved it. Well, we didn't approve it. It was a split vote on our board. The, co the board of commissioners ultimately approved it three to two. And it did, it is in the court system. So just Jim, there is that one situation, I don't know how, sure. where, what the status of it is, but um, the, uh, one of the principals in that uh, PUD did tell me that he, they were taking it, uh, challenging it in court. Michelle Hoffman, yeah. State's Attorney's Office. And I would, get, would again say they must, in that case, since our office hasn't seen any appeal of the board's decision, they must be enforcing their covenants. And even if the Supreme Court in that case was to view the use of the VHR as a residential use under that, those covenants would not necessarily be determined, would not necessarily, necessarily determine how a Supreme Court would consider this issue. Because again, it comes back to what the party's intent was. And in this case, it's what was the board's intent in 2005. Okay. Uh, further questions for Michelle? Sonny? No comment. Okay. Um, um, Kathy, do you have something? I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, thank you. I just like to say that um, I've I've always, even with this in previous situations, I've always felt that um, allowing a VHR, even though it's just in one lot, let's say one landowner, one homeowner in a PUD, it changes the character of the PUD. And so I do think that there, it, the the the, um, the view of the staff that the, and the legal counsel, that the other landowners, the other homeowners in the PUD need to agree with this change is important. Uh, because, you know, even though you can argue that it's, it doesn't change its use because it's still residential, it does change its use because it's a um, kind of rotating residential. And so I, I think that's very important to consider that the other owners uh, concur or do not concur with these major amendments for this purpose. Thank you, Kathy. Anything further for Michelle before I go to the speaker request forms? I believe Mr. Tushin had a question. Oh, that's right. Uh, Mr. Tushin, are you still on the line? Yes, I am here. Go ahead and, and uh, ask your question, question for uh, her. Her uh, statement that uh, this is not considered residential in use. Now, I I have uh, watched a video from many, many, many of the um, commission hearings, and on February 24th, and I'd actually talked to the person who set me up on the call here about playing this back. On February 24th, Michelle specifically states, and I have a quote here, that VHRs are, re are viewed as residential use, and the actual use is people residing in the home. So my question is, why are you changing your stance on that now? I mean, you specifically stated it several times, or it again at, uh, at the 5520 mark of that hearing, you stated it again, there is no difference between short and long-term rentals of VHR is not a commercial use and is not a home occupation, short-term and long-term rentals are both residential use. Uh, That's quoted directly from the, the uh, meeting on that day. I have no doubt that that is an exact quote, Mr. Tushin, but what's missing and what's been part of memo since 2016 when this issue was first discussed in terms of whether this bo commission or board should consider uh, covenants is that that stems from that is what the majority of jurisdictions have held, not South Dakota. That, uh, that is what the majority of jurisdictions has held. There are also minority jurisdictions that have viewed it from the use of the landowner 
specifically, I believe, Louisiana, that have held that VHRs um, are commercial uses. So I have no doubt that is an exact quote, but it's missing a piece. That piece is that is what the majority of juris jurisdictions have held. Also, that's been part and parcel of an earlier discussion stemming from 2016, that because interpreting these covenants involves rules of complex contract construction, that's why we don't go there. We do not go there to interpret these covenants. And as I indicated earlier, we're not considering your covenants. We are not interpreting what was intended in your covenants between the three property owners. We have to interpret it what the, what the ordinance said. So that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at your covenants. We're looking at what was the board's intent at the time they approved the plan unit development in your case. But I have no doubt that's an exact quote, but it's missing some pieces. Okay. South Dakota hasn't yeah. ruled. Covenants that's simply what other jurisdictions so well. have stated. We're not looking at that, but yet the, um, the zoning says that a, this is a permitted use within a plan unit development. So I'm, I'm kind of getting two different directions here. And, and you say you're not looking at the covenants with, say, a single use. But yet the ordinance says this is a permitted use, not a conditional use, but permitted use within a planned unit development. Actually, the, Mr. Tushin, the, uh, just for, uh, for your reference, the ordinance actually says that a VHR may be an allowed use. It's subject to approval at the time of the rezone and the approval of the PUD. With that being said, if you look to the how the ordinance read in 2005, at the time PO 417 was approved, VHRs were not included as an, al uh, as an allowed use within a PUD. But let's, let's go back to 2005. Uh, and even prior to that, most rentals were not allowed anywhere in the Black Hills legally. Is that correct? Because I, I believe that uh, you know, there was a big battle between vacation home rentals and the county. And uh, so, you know, I, I had several people asked me to join in on that. And at the time, I wasn't doing any rentals. It was just family and friends using my cabin, so I turned them down. But uh, at that time, if that wasn't allowed, so that law changed. So now the law changed, and it applies to everybody else, but it does not apply to me. And she's there also, so the law changed, and now that's on the books as a law. How can the law apply to everybody else that's now doing rentals and allowed to it doesn't apply to me? It's a very good question, uh, Mr. Tushin, and it's a bit complicated. What you need to understand in 2012, uh, VHRs were uh, permitted as a conditional use in general egg, limited egg, light residential, and suburban residential. They were approved as conditional uses. With regard to PUDs, because they are their own unique zoning district, you are limited to the uses as approved at that time. For instance, even though we currently have a ordinance on the book that says VHRs may be allowed in PUD, we have PUDs today that are approved and do not include use of VHRs. We also have PUDs that are approved that do include VHRs. But again, PUDs are their own individual districts and they're limited, the loud uses are those that are stated in the ordinance. So unfortunately, the change in the ordinance in 2012 really didn't, doesn't affect you because you're subject to the uses as approved back in 2005. Okay. Now, one more question. Now, you're also going back to what you're interpreting in 2005. Now, I purchased my property in 2005, and at the time... Uh, Ralph Corey was a developer. He was in the process of creating the planned unit development, and uh, I'm not sure where it was yet then, but one of my um, uh, requirements when I made the offer to purchase the property, and I worked through Mike Alley at Exit Realty, and I've talked to Mike several times during this process over the last couple of months, was that I had a contingency that I would be able to, to do vacation home rentals when I purchased a property. Ralph Corey was aware of that. He's the one who drew this all up. And nowhere, anywhere was it in, uh, stated to me that that was not allowed. Um, it was all reviewed. And um, 
so I'm, I'm the interpretation there was that I was allowed to because that was a contingency of me buying the property. So, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time saying how you guys can go back and say his, I mean, Ralph's the one who grew it up, how you can say that he did not when I know it was a contingency when I bought the property that I would be able to. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, go ahead, Travis. Mr. Tushin, I believe whenever you first brought this to our attention, I did mention that any evidence that you would have if you would submit that to the Planning Commission so that we could review it, and that was one of those particular pieces of item that you stated that you had, um, you know, that guarantee, and I would like to see it so that we could have that as, as a Planning Commission to evaluate that, that particular piece of evidence. I, and I haven't seen that. I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, and if it hasn't, if you've seen it. Yeah, I, I talked to Mike Galley about that and asked him what he had. He said, well, you know, you made the offer back then. We don't have any of that on paper. You know, he said that was a contingency. It was looked up. We talked to Ralph about it, and he cannot. He told me he doesn't have any paperwork or anything from that occurring. Mr. Tushin, when did you uh, submit your offer on the property? Do you recall? Pardon me? When did you uh, submit your offer on the property? Do you recall? Um, it was, I believe, July of 2005. Um, the PUD was approved in January or February of 2005. Correct. So, Correct. And I've also talked to Mike about that, too, because I was standing over his shoulder when he looked it up on the computer. And his explanation to me a month ago when I talked to him was that it looks like this had been approved, but it was not filed um, yet on the computer. So the computer still showed it as being zoned agricultural because when I looked over his shoulder, he showed me that it was zoned agricultural. And his explanation to me is, and, and again, he's you're going back 15 years, is he's telling me my own explanation is that it probably wasn't updated on the computer because um, he says, I know that. That was one of your contingencies also. But we also talked to Ralph Corey about it. And Ralph Corey was well aware of it and did not, you know, make anything. So the only the only change was then it was zoned uh, agricultural instead of a planned uh, PUD, which, and then uh, Mike Alley stated to me that uh, at this time it doesn't matter because uh, vacation home rentals are still being argued anyway. Uh, well, the point is, is that uh, Ralph Corey was the one who drew it up. And Ralph Corey knew that this was a contingency of it. Therefore, I am stating that uh, the intention of it was not to deny him at that point because he was aware of it, and, and that was part of the purchase agreement. Well, given, I would just point out that since the PUD was approved in January, February 2005, that at that time, VHRs were not allowed under, it appears, under the terms of this particular PUD or in general agriculture. So in terms of contingencies of your deal, I can't speak to that, and that's between you and Mr. Corey. I, I, you know, people can come into all sorts of agreements, but that doesn't mean that that use is per se, allowed under county ordinance. So I... Well, and, and I'm not saying that. That's not, that's not what I was trying to say here. What I was trying to say here is, is you're, you're trying to... Are you, uh, you're saying that the interpretation at the time was that they were not to be allowed, that uh, uh, this was to be single family, and single family was to be interpreted, interpreted as not to allow vacation home rentals, where I'm saying that that cannot be his interpretation because he, was, he knew the understanding that when I was purchasing the property... That that was my intent. Again, I, and, and I'll just leave it at this: is that at that time VHRs weren't allowed. Period. Whether general, whether a residential PUD or general commercial, they weren't allowed. Right. And I understand that. I understand that. My, like I said again, my, my intent was that uh, at some future point, and we were not renting at that point. We didn't. For you know, our, our, our intent was at some point we intended to and hoped to be able to do it. So that was just a contingency at the time. And again, we were stated that uh, you know you'd be able to. So I'm, I'm just saying that at that time, Ralph's definitely intention was that yes, I would be able to. That he, it was not written in there that I do not want home vacational rentals to occur here, because he was aware that that was um, part of my contingency of buying it. Thank, thank you, sir, for your questions. Um, do you have any further questions for Michelle before I go to the speaker request forms? And, and Mr. Tushin, if you would stay on. Uh, if we have any other questions, I would appreciate it. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the next, uh, I have two speaker request forms. It looks like they're uh, coordinated here. Uh, the first one would be um, Michael Steve. Um, sir, please, uh, when you get to the podium, state your name for the record. Thanks. Morning, Michael Steve, and I am here on behalf of the owners of Track 3, one of which Jason Steele is also here today. And we just want to make clear that we object to the proposed major amendment, um, not only on the grounds that goes against the intent of the PUD when it was first formed in 2005, like Ms. Hoffman had just explained, but that also, you know, our clients and likely the owners of Tract 1, who I believe also object, would significantly have both their investment in the property and their use in the property harmed. Um, when the PUD was created, it was the intent of these homes would simply be a residential use only. And as has been more thoroughly explained earlier, back when 2005 when that happened, VHRs weren't part of these residential uses. It was for the family that bought it and to live there. Our client knew of these uses when he purchased the property later on, and that's what he wanted to use it as, to allow other people to come in here and rent and use these as vacation homes not only takes away from his enjoyment of that, having trailers, renters, everybody come in there in and out every weekend, treat it as their vacation. It also it damages the property, but also damages the use. Um, the other thing that I need to make sure is that, you know, this intent was the agreed upon use by the county and the developer at that time and everybody who bought it and that's what controlled and it's what controls today during their ownership of the property the Tushins it's clear that they have ignored this and have been leasing it out as a vacation home rental not only listing it on VRBO and related sites but they filed for a DBA for Bell Pines number two and again this damage that my client and likely the client or the owner of tract one has suffered during this time have been both you know physically to the property but just unruly guests in the enjoyment of his time while he's been there. We would also like to note that the Tushins are now effectively trying to unilaterally rezone the property. Um, as Ms. Hoffman had described before, to do one of these major amendments is simply like trying to start over and rezone and create a new PUD. He's trying to do that to his benefit without the consent of everybody else. To be able to have the VHR that now he wants that was no that was not previously allowed there to the detriment and against the objection of our client and the other owners of the PUD. This not only of course goes against the intent of the PUD originally, but it's clear that was not allowed as she had mentioned, these VHRs weren't even in applicable use at the time. But they also know that they weren't allowed by simply they're moving to amend at the moment. And I know there was some question on whether or not VHRs would be deemed a residential use by South Dakota Supreme Court. Well, I know Ms. Hoffman had discussed that this has not been actually litigated out by the South Dakota Supreme Court. I would like to note that VHRs are a lodging establishment and that other lodging establishments in the state of South Dakota have been delineated and differentiated from a residential use by the South Dakota Supreme Court. So as such, in the interest of my client as an owner of the PUD who would be significantly damaged from the amendment, both financially and due to their impaired enjoyment, and just simply for their objection to this attempt by the Tushins to unilaterally essentially rezone this PUD, we ask that you uphold the original PUD plan and deny the Tushins proposed amendment. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. St uh, Steele? Steve, sorry. Seeing none here, uh, hold on, hold on, if you would, just for a second, I'll go through the electrons here. Uh, Kathy, do you have any questions? No. Jim? Uh, I guess, <clears throat> pardon me, no. Sandy? No. And Sonny? No. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Steele, do you would you like to come up, sir? Good. 
Go ahead. My name is Jason Steele. I'm the owner of Track 3 in this PUD and I uh, want to state that I'm adamantly opposed to changing the, the rules and uh, the way things are in this PUD right now. Um, the owners of Tract 1 have also submitted a letter. They are opposed to it. And I just want to make clear that um, when all three of us purchased this property, we were made aware that we were not allowed to rent. I think that's been pretty uh, um, painted pretty clearly here this morning. And um, I lived there full time. And so I have to put up with these renters. And um, I just don't think it's fair to change the rules that we have in place now. Um, I'm not talking about covenants. I'm talking about the spirit of the law and the way this, uh, this PUD was actually planned out. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Question. Uh, yes, sir. Tell me when you purchased your property. In 2009. Okay. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Steele? Travis, uh, Kathy, do you have any questions for Mr. Steele? No. Jim? No. Sandy? No. Sonny? No. All right, thank you. Mr. Uh, Tushin, before we, uh, um, I guess go to some final comments maybe by everyone here and, and vote on this issue. Uh, would you like to, or are there any further comments from you, sir? Uh, yeah, the only other comments I have is just uh, pertaining to the attorney that just spoke who says, you know, I'm still advertising my property on um, several sites. And, and just, just a comment here, I have, I have used um, homeaway.com uh, has a free calendar system that's been out there for 15 years before. Home owned is privately owned, you know, they got bought out by Travelocity, I believe, a couple of years ago. But uh, prior to that, they had a free, you know, it was entirely free. And you could go out there, and I, I used it. Uh, I owned the property with four of my brothers, or three of my brothers, sorry. And for, for forever, we've used it uh, um, between the four of us, between all of our families. We have somebody there all the time, and that's, I use that calendaring system to track who is there. So if my brother's friends are going out there or whatever, what's marked on the calendar? So my comment is uh, just because I, I'm using um, home away calendaring system it does not mean I'm renting the property. I'm using that calendaring system. You go out there and look at it today. You'll see um, all the dates are blocked. Uh, the dates my brother's going to be out there in two weeks. I'm going to be out there. You know, shortly after that, if the cover dates are blocked on there. But uh, I also use it. Uh, we're allowed to to uh, rent your cabin legally. I mean, uh, if you're not approved for the HR, you're still allowed to legally rent your cabin 14 a year. So I still, I, I've always used it, try to use it to, uh, to book Dirk this week. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to get it out there. I used to use, um, like, Craigslist and things like that. But, uh, and I had good luck with it for quite a few years, but then the more and more of that home away was being used, the harder and harder it got to, to be uh, to book it. So um, I, I probably will continue to use it just for that and to, to book my 14 days a year, which is legal. Um, so I'm, I'm just stating that, you know, just because you see my calendar out there and it shows dates blocked off, that does not mean it's rented. Um, it's, it just means I'm using their their utility to track uh, one family or friends or somebody else that you Thanks. Thank you. Um, any further comments? I. <clears throat> I guess my only my comment is is that um, I, I see this as a, not a VHR issue. Um, I, I see this as a as a PUD issue. One of the th things um, with the PUDs is is, is that uh, you know things are are either a, a allowed, and if they are allowed, then they're written in as as an allowance. And I I see this as as a PUD uh, issue. And I um, the the uses in the PUD are subject to the people that are are within the PUD, and so uh, in in this instance, um, you know, we, there's two out of the three 
folks in the PUD that that don't uh, necessarily um, want you know these items to continue um, or or be permitted for that matter and within the PUD so um, this is an in interesting uh, <clears throat> item with respect to the history of all of this. And Michelle, thank you for uh, coming up with the sequence of the, the history of how things were done um, through the years. That, that, has, that has helped me um, uh, at least uh, have an understanding of, of everything uh, associated with this item. Um, with that, uh, staff is seeking guidance from the, the Planning Commission on how to proceed with this uh, planned unit development. Um, is there a motion? Rick, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to deny without prejudice Major Plan Unit Development Amendment PU 20-01. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion on the item? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Jim. <clears throat> uh, I'd just like to comment that, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> um, that I think the real issue is that, that, that this issue of what is residential usage needs to be resolved. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the distinction is such that, that without that, I mean, with, without it being clarified, we're going to continue to run into these kinds of problems. And, um, so I'm going to vote in favor, or I'm going to oppose the denial, uh, because I, I'd like to see us uh, somehow have somebody come up with a, uh, a legal opinion that would draw some lines here so that we wouldn't have to go through this time and time again. And, um, and I, I don't think that would be particularly uh, harmful <clears throat> to go through that process, but someone needs to, if, if if the issue is ever going to be resolved, so anyway, I don't uh, disagree with your comments, um, Jim. Uh, the the one thing I would say though that this this is within a PUD, so it's not like this piece of property is is out and it's zoned low density residential, and he has all the correct acreage, and he's next next to some folks that that don't necessarily want him there. He's within a, a planned unit development that has its own specific rules to those three pieces of property, so it's it it it's not even considered the same. Um, although the same issues are coming up, uh, in my mind, it's it's not considered the same thing. Um, and I'm I'm not a big proponent of these PUDs, period, because uh, 20 years down the road, the bus driver's gone. There's no one, there's no one controlling, there's no one driving the, the issues that are associated with these things. And unfortunately, they're left to the Planning Commission to interpret the history and understand what was intended. So anyway, sorry, Michelle, I'll let you, uh, I'll get you, off my soapbox and let you answer Jim's question. You, you took the words out of my mouth and that this is a PUD issue, not a VHR issue. So even if we get some sort of guidance and resolve, how, how would the Supreme Court really view uh, VH, you know, what, it, the definition of residential use? It doesn't solve the issue in this case. PUDs have very specific allowed uses, and that's what we're limited to. So we hopefully will resolve that issue, Jim, in the future, but it's, it wouldn't resolve the issue in this case. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. And I'd like to point out, most of y'all already know that a lot of times I'm very in favor of VHRs because I do believe in private property rights. But I think the PUD and the history of it on this particular piece is what actually had me go against it. And even Michelle would agree. I'm always advocating for, oh, let's do a VHR because it's their private property and they should be able to do it. But in this case, there was already some con uh, in the PUD uh, constraints that led me to say that this is the appropriate action with this particular property, not necessarily all in the future. Okay. Further uh, discussion on the item? Kathy, do you have any further discussion? No. Sandy? No. Sonny? No. Okay. Uh, with that, um, the motion is to deny without prejudice uh, planned unit development amendment PU uh, 20 01. Uh, roll call vote. Rich. I'm an aye in favor of the den denial. Okay. Kathy? Aye. 
Jim? No. Travis? Aye. Gary? Aye. Sandy? Aye. And Sonny? Aye. Motion does not carry. Thank uh, you. If wait a minute. It motion does. did carry. We oh, the mo motion. <laughs> mo cor correct. The, uh, the motion did carry. Um, six I, to one. Six to one. I, my apologies for that. I know what you meant, but I was like, wait a minute. Uh, brings us to item 17. Cody Sack Environmental Planner. The following items have been placed on the construction permit agenda to be heard for public comment and will not be voted on by the Planning Commission. Any Planning Commissioner, staff member, or audience member may comment on any of the items. Comments received will be considered by the Planning Director who will make the final decision for the construction permit. Um, item number 17 is construction permit CP 20-07. It's to excavate and grade for future building sites. Um, the only thing to note on this one was the work started prior to the approval of the construction permit. The applicant came in and paid all applicable fees. Um, staff has really no issues with okay. the request. My only question on this one was who is the contractor? Olson Excavating. Okay, thank you. Any uh, comments or questions from anyone here on, on the uh, from the membership? Seeing none and hearing none, anyone in the audience wish to speak on this issue? Okay. Uh, we don't, uh, for those in the audience, we don't vote on the construction related items. So we are moving on to item 18. <clears throat> item 18 is construction permit CP 20-08. It's to excavate and grade for construction activities associated with an asphalt bash plant. Uh, the applicant's Western Construction, they have a current um, construction permit. This um, was just to. Um, Construction permits are good for a year. They can be extended to the second year, and then after the second year, if they still need it, they have to repay the fee and apply again. Uh, that's what this is for. And they've submitted a um, floodplain development permit um, for some work that was done in the floodplain. No concerns from staff on this item. Oh. Anybody on the commission uh, have any questions? Seeing none, hearing none, no one in the audience. Has any questions on this item? We're moving on to item 19. Um, item 19 is construction permit CP 20 09. It's to um, it's construction, it's to rebuild an existing distribution line to include gradings for roads. The applicant's Black Hills Energy. Uh, this construction permit goes with the CUP that they applied for today and that was approved. Um, Staff has no real concerns with this. Um, I did receive from the South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources their notice of intent um, for their general stormwater permit. You have everything you need from Black Hills Power on this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, anyone have any questions on this item? Seeing none and hearing none. Um, you don't wish to speak on this, correct? Only if there's questions? Correct. All right. Moving on to uh, item 20. Um, item 20 is construction permit CP 20-10. Um, it's the construction and access road slash driveway on, to the applic applicant's property. The applicant's Pat Wiederholt. Uh, the road was put in uh, by the previous landowner. He was sold land. Um, he paid all the applicable fees. Um, the road does cross the section line, and um, he has applied for a road construction of section line right away. That will be heard at the next board meeting next Tuesday. Um, other than that, staff has no concerns with this construction permit either. Any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, moving on to item 21, county board report. Thank you, Cody. Good morning again. The county board report. The board of commissioners concurred with the planning commission's recommendations from the April 13th, 2020 planning commission meeting. Well, that was simple. Items from the <laughs> public. 
There are no items. There are there is no one left in the chamber, so there is no items from the public. Items from staff. No items. That's got to be some sort of record. I think that's the first, isn't it? it might be at a least first. as I've been around. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, items from the membership. Does anybody have anything? Nothing here up front. Uh, Kathy, anything from you? No. Jim. No. Sandy. <clears throat> I said enough. No. <laughs> Sunny. No. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So, so move. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Last chance. Seeing none, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Travis. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Gary. Sandy said aye. Oh, aye. aye. Yeah. Sunny. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.